prepare to follow you like the good kings of our life. Father's Day was first celebrated in Spokane, Washington in June 19, 1910. Sonora Smart Dobbs had heard a Mother's Day sermon at her church and she asked her pastor if he would honor fathers in a similar sermon in June. So her dad, William Jackson Smart, was a Civil War vet and a single parent to six children. And she was really proud of the way that he lived his life and very grateful for her upbringing under him as his daughter. Now Father's Day was a little slower than Mother's Day to take off and become a recognized holiday and it isn't still quite celebrated with quite as much gusto. In fact, I read the following in preparation for the sermon. A child asks, what is Father's Day? And a person answers, it's just like Mother's Day. The only difference is that you don't have to spend so much money. <laughs> In fact, the statistics show that we will spend 17% less on our fathers than we did on our mothers on their day of recognition. <clears throat> Don't really understand why there is a difference. Maybe the women's gifts have better marketers, or maybe the contribution to a family is a little bit less visible for a father. Irma Bombeck, whose dad died when she was only nine, wrote the following in response to a question about what fathers do. As a child, I observed they brought around the car, she said, when it rained so that everybody else would stay dry. They always took the family pictures, which is why they were never in it. They carved turkeys on Thanksgiving, kept the car gassed up, weren't afraid to go in the basement, mowed the lawn, and straightened the clothesline when it sagged. It wasn't until my husband and I had children that I was able to observe firsthand what a father contributed to a child's life. What did he do? He threw them higher than they, until they were weak from laughter. He cast the deciding vote on the puppy debate. He listened more than spoke. He let them make mistakes. He allowed them to fall from their two-wheeler without having a heart attack. If I had to tell a son what a father really does, Irma says, it would be that he shows up for the job in good times and in bad. He's a man who is constantly being observed by his children, and they learn from him how to handle adversity, anger, disappointment, and success. He won't laugh at their dreams, no matter how impossible they may seem. He'll dig out at 1 a.m. when a child has run out of gas. He'll make unpopular decisions and stand by them. And when he's wrong and makes a mistake, he will admit it. He sets the tone for the family members, how they treat one another, and how they treat people of the opposite sex, and how they treat people who are different from them. By example, he can instill a desire to give something back to the community. Irma concludes, a father has the potential to be a powerful force in the life of a child. So grab it, and maybe you'll get a greeting card, and maybe you won't, but at least it's steady work. John Eldridge, another author, compares the male family leadership to the role of a king. And he says that to wield power and influence and property is a noble undertaking. It's also very difficult. And he suggests that many of our miseries today come because there are men who have power but do not have the heart of a king. John reminds us that becoming a good king is a matter of heart and he draws from Proverbs 21. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it where he wills. 
all deeds are right in the sight of the doer, but the Lord weighs the heart. This is the difference between King Saul, who was anointed last week, and King David. Both have a relationship with God. Both have the prophet Samuel to interpret the will of God with them. Both, sorry, but Saul is disobedient because his heart's not aligned with God. That funny video that we watched with the children summarized Saul very well. He didn't follow the directions well, and he was more full of himself, full of the pride over the battles he won, full of the glory over the sheep and cattle that he'd taken from war, rather than being open to God. Saul's actions make me think of the song my Way, which was written by Paul Anka and sung by many musicians, including Elvis Presley. The song is a story of a man who, having grown older, reflects on his life. And he describes a man being comfortable with his own mortality and one who's really willing to take responsibility for his own actions. But the song eliminates any room for God or even love of others. The first verse says, I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway and more, much more than this. I, I did it my way. The message of the second verse adds, it says, I did what I had to do and I saw it through without exemption. I planned each charted course, each careful step along the byway and much more than this. I did it my way. The last verse wraps it up for me. What's a man? What's he got? If he hasn't himself, then he has not. To say the things he really feels and not the words of one who kneels. The records show I took the blow and I did it my way. Elvis was a really popular musician known as the king of rock and roll or even just the king. And he both sang and lived the principles of this song. He had it all, wealth and power. And he'd overcome many adversities in life. But he died alone and in personal humiliation. There's more to life than material goods and self-sufficiency. Kneeling in prayer is one way to connect to God's abundantly loving direction. My way or God's way, it's a choice. Samuel is sent to find Israel's next king, and this time height and majesty and looks are not going to be a factor because the Lord does not see mortals, verse 16, 7. Mortals look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. David, a boy, the youngest of Jesse, who God asked Samuel to anoint, will not be perfect. He will always, though, have a heart for God. Throughout our whole summer series, we will hear stories of David praying to God and David writing songs for God, and even David letting loose and dancing abandonedly for God. And we'll also see how he puts aside time to listen to God. Yet to have a heart for God means to have a posture that's open and aware of God, and to find fulfillment in your relationship with God. The test of a king is not personal success. It's not the horsepower of the truck that you're driving. It's not how big your TV is. The test of a true king in life is what life is like for the people under his authority. Is his wife tired and stressed out and overlooked? Are his children flourishing? Do the people that work for him feel that they are building his kingdom? Or do they feel that he is serving them, helping them to grow? Now Jesus taught his disciples that while most rulers on earth rely on positional authority to control people, it would not be so with the disciples. Whoever becomes 
wants to become first among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be great must be a slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life in ransom for many. Robert Greenleaf, the person who coined the term servant leadership for business, asks, do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous? Are they more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least? privileged in society. Billy Graham claimed that potentially the father is the best possible teacher about God that a child can have. For the father is the human counterpoint to God. Jesus taught his disciples to pray in this manner, our father who art in heaven. He taught the disciples that they were to think of the eternal God in terms of a wise, devoted, generous, forgiving father. A child who's never had the privilege of loving a father has a serious handicap when it comes to understanding the nature and character of God. Now I've talked a lot about fathers, but sometimes it isn't our biological parent who's kingly and instrumental in our life. Sometimes it's a stepdad, or an uncle, or a granddad, or a great-granddad. For others, it's been a scoutmaster, a youth leader, or a mentor. Some of you right now are leading other men in your life who are not your sons. Some of us might also be worrying if we miss the mark as a parent as a leader, and we hope for grace. Ernest Hemingway grew up in a very devout evangelical family and yet was always looking for that experience of the grace of Christ. He experienced liberty and wisdom, yet he was always, he was, um, there was no father, no parent waiting for him, and so he sank into a mire of graceless depression. A short story he wrote perhaps reveals the grace that he had hoped for. It's a story of a Spanish father who decided to reconcile with his son who would run away to Madrid. The father, in a moment of remorse, takes out an ad in the Al Librio, a newspaper. Paca, meet me at the Hotel Montana, <coughs> noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Papa. When the father arrived in the square in hopes of meeting his son, he found hundreds of Pacos waiting to be reunited with a father. <coughs> now, it could just be that Paco is a very popular name, or it could be that a father's forgiveness is the salve, the salve for every soul. Our Heavenly Father is always waiting with open arms to welcome him back into his embrace and so that we can start again with a renewed heart. Fathers are like a king with a heart for God. They are measured by health and wisdom and liberation and autonomy of those who they care for. They teach us about the nature and character of God and they set an example daily. They show their children how to handle adversity, anger, disappointment, success. They teach us how God loves. The other day I was visiting with Melvin Chase and we were watching really old videos, one of a 70th church anniversary and one of a senior dinner. And he had this tone of excitement and of reverence and honor. And he'd say, that's my dad. That's Mickey Bixiglio. 
And he pointed out to me all the kings of the congregation. These were men that made a difference, a significant difference in his life, teaching about God by living that Christian example. So much of a man's contributions go by unnoticed and underappreciated. So I'm glad that we can set aside at least one day to call our dads or the men in our life that were that nurturing example and tell them just one more time how much we love and appreciate them. And if your dad has passed, like the kings in Melvin's videos, you can still connect to them through prayer. Connect through your heart. A heart for the men in your life who taught you about God. And a heart for God. Amen.